<laughs> Fantastic. Welcome to the Lake Forest podcast, a podcast about the lovely city of Lake Forest, featuring topics like local news, sports, music, people, food, and of course, history. My name is Pete, and I'm joined with my co-host, Lake Forest history legend, Arthur Miller, and we all live in Lake Forest. Before we start our class, we have a sponsor for the show, Dakota Insurance Group. They've got your back. Why? Because that's what friends are for. Dakota Insurance handles all your residential and commercial insurance needs. Get a quote now at dakotainsurancegroup.com. Okay, one of the goals of the podcast is for our listeners to learn a little bit more about Lake Forest. Well, who better to teach us about Lake Forest history than Lake Forest history legend Arthur Miller? Everybody take your seats, fold your hands on top of the desk. Our class is about to begin. Art, how you been? Well, I'm good. And we're going to be joined by um, Carol Summerfield from the Art oh. from the, the History, History Center in Lake Forest. She's um, just as much of an authority. We have different hands on the elephant a little bit. So yeah. it makes a big combination. We're going to complement each other today. We're going to talk about, um, since we just had a big, big influx of people into Lake Forest in the last year during the pandemic, year and a half, uh, we're going to talk about um, the different waves of, of, of people have come, when they've come from, and why they came. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the um, early early groups much, and then especially Carol is going to bring in one of the major topics that's developed in recent years, um, understanding the uh, waves of support community that came into this community. It was a millionaire's community from the get-go, and um, often it was the the, the, the support community people who knew more about what to do um, with all that money than the, than the rich people themselves. So we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. Carol? That sounds great. Thank you, Art. Thank you, Pete, Pete for inviting me. I love being here. This is always such a pleasure. Um, all right, so let's get started with some of those early stories. So the, in the beginning, in the beginning, uh, there was a combination of political, health, and um, those were big, and just the, the rapid growth of the city of Chicago that caused people to want to leave uh, out. Um, I'm talking about the part of East Lake Forest. There was an earlier wave, uh, 20 years earlier in the 1830s of, of um, people who settled on unclaimed land after the Native Americans pulled out in 1836. And that was in Everett, which became part of Lake Forest in 1925. Um, Everett had uh, largely people from Ireland who were settling. Uh, they had come to help on the Illinois and Michigan Canal. Uh, they settled the land. The families were set, set up there. Then the uh, fathers went off to, and, and husbands went off to work on the canal, uh, Illinois Michigan Canal, until it went toes up. In 1836, they had a little financial panic. Thank God we never have any of those anymore. Um, and uh, so they went and decided to make uh, those farms into serious operations. Um, so I'm going to interrupt really briefly because it's one of my favorite random facts. So the Homestead Act, which was developed in order to settle land, and one of the things about being declared open territory when they would sort of forcibly relocate the natives who were here, um, once that land opened up officially, um, Homestead Act allowed you to basically live on land and work it for five years. And one of my little favorite asides is there was a laundry list of things you had to do to the property every year in order to maintain your rights to it. And so when Sears and Roebuck develop, they develop because they basically build kits designed to support the Homestead Act. So you had to have wood doors, you had to have glass panels in your windows, you had to have a wood roof and they produced all those things. And then one of the last things you had to do was sort of embellish the house. And so the various filigree work, some of the stuff that we think of as sort of the old grand dam houses where they had all that decorative work on the top, 
much of that was Sears kit stuff and much of it ex exists to this day. But so for a lot of those settlers who were sort of running that strip, you wanted to be near a train line so you could get the supplies in order to maintain your um, status on the land as being something that you were demonstrating improvement on. And there was an inspector who showed up to make sure you were delivering on what you were supposed to do. So this was an earlier wave probably that came, They some of them officially were here by 1836. They, they may have snuck in under the fence. Um, never happens anymore either. And <laughs> they, their best link to stuff was a little port at Port Clinton, which was sort of um, east of Everett, uh, over by, um, well, Fort Sheridan territory now. And there was a, there was a lake port there for 1830s, 1840s, 1850s, until the train came through in 1855. And then that really changed things in 1855 because you could get supplies much easier to your house. But an awful lot of the construction in like Everett was um, what you could do with your ax and a few other tools. Yeah, hand hewn uh, logs and then uh, hand planed. Yep. Yeah, well, this is the Stooping House yeah. in Highland Park. Is, yeah, perfect example of that. Yep. So um, they, they function as much as they could through that period. Um, and they were trying to get, they would get jobs in the city, but the Irish had some disadvantages. They came from Ireland where they had been in the farming business, which they knew. But in the city, they couldn't get very big jobs because they didn't have a lot of training unless they'd been house servants. And house servants, as soon as the rich people showed up in the, early, in the middle 18, in late 1850s in East Lake Forest, they snapped to it because they had actually taken care of rich people. The rich people that came out here were new rich people. They were so new that they were embarrassed about it uh, to some extent. In the city, rich people, well, everybody had come 20 years earlier, and there's a book, um, Bygone Days in Early Chicago by a guy named Cook in 1910, and he writes about how there was a lot of jealousy. So people knew that um, if your neighbor got rich and you still weren't rich, uh, one way they got rich was being a little crooked. And so um, why did they get rich? Well, so actually... Probably they weren't crooked. They just saved their money. They didn't spend it uh, many times, but there were a few crooked people. But the ones that came out to Lake Forest had gotten rich and were a little bit reluctant to share that information with a lot of other people. So the advantage was street traffic didn't just wander into town. And the plan of the city anyway made it impossible to find anybody. No, no addresses in Lake Forest were published until well into the 20th century. You had to know where you were going or you couldn't find it. So that was the initial wave. They also had come because of cholera. The um, cemetery in Lake Forest was all set up in 1860, ready for another cholera epidemic. It didn't happen here. But 1,500 people had died in Chicago in 1854. Um, and that was a big problem. So they wanted to get out of the city they wanted good drainage. And what was better drainage than the big ravines in Lake Forest? So that was, that was, a big, that was one big incentive. And um, another, a third kind of thing was that the Irish who were predominant in Chicago, a lot of Chicagoans, the, um, the Irish kids were pretty um, sophisticated street um, functioners. The, um, Lake Forest youngsters, the Presbyterian kids that were in school and schools down there, the boys especially, where they would be dressed in little Lord Fauntleroy type suits and would go off to school and they would walk home and some Irish kid would come up and go slam, boom. So then they would go home all beat up. And so the parents wanted them out of town. Also, if that didn't happen, as they went along, they noticed these interesting places called saloons. And also there were some ladies that were sort of dressed up in interesting costume. And the parents were getting a little nervous about all this impact because Chicago was a major transit center 
growing very rapidly. All kinds of um, stuff was going on here. And they thought their kids would be much better off out of town. So they started the schools, built their first building in 1859, and the kids came first. There were 60 kids out here by about 1860, 1861. And their parents started building around them, you know. Um, there was a girls' school that was started up in 1859 also. An academy was privately funded. Um, and it was very successful from 1859 to 1867. So these schools were the first wave and a few teachers. Um, the very beginnings were these Presbyterians were um, coming out Sundays to sort of stay out here and things. Uh, they had, um, from the beginning, African-Americans with them. Uh, these would probably have been escaped slaves. There was um, Underground Railroad was both here and was being run on a wholesale scale by uh, people like Sylvester Wynn out of his um, lumberyard in Chicago, shipping people up the lakes. But um, his, and there's still his little garage that's left um, at the end of, at the north end of the driveway for 550 East Deer Path. It's on Presbyterian Church land now. But um, he ran a little subunit of that um, that program, actually, Underground Railroad, through his house. Um, so the um, early people came for health reasons, those, and the final one would be political. Uh, the Irish and the Germans loved to imbibe. The Presbyterians were teetotalers. The Presbyterians believed that you shouldn't have any fun ever on Sunday. The Germans loved their beer halls. Um, the Germans were liberal and anti-slave. The Irish were kind of afraid of a lot of free labor arriving, uh, ch cheap labor arriving in Chicago that would undercut them on their wages. So they didn't want to force, by having the blue laws in Chicago, they didn't want to force the Germans to vote along with the Irish and therefore form a sort of pro-slavery alternative. So the best thing to do was to leave. So um, the Methodists went to Evanston, the um, Presbyterians went to Wheaton and to Lake Forest, uh, and they, they both mostly gave up on socially controlling the city. Well, and the other thing that Art and I had talked about early on, too, is that, you know, we all know about the Great Fire in 1871, but if you go through and you read the old headlines, pretty much from 1855 on, every two to three years, there'd be a huge headline in the newspaper that says the Great Fire. Yeah. <laughs> because it turns out that if you soak a house wood in turpentine and then light it with gas flame, bad things can happen. And, um, and sure. so sections of the city would burn every couple years. And um, by, it's not even in 1871 that they really start changing the way they build within the city. It's really another fire that takes place in 1873. That's like an additional 60 blocks where the city finally says, all right, we're gonna put in gangways. We're gonna recess the houses. We're gonna build them out of brick. Um, and we're going to start to control this because it just was an untenable way to keep what was at that point now nearly a million people. And, um, and the sort of um, displacement that came out of these events sort of forced people to look at where they could go. You know, it's, it's interesting when you look at the history of Chicago, um, Chicagoans who live down in the loop, their first place where they would go to summer to get away from the um, pollution and the smell and all that was to Rogers Park. The um, great, what is it, pink building that is there, that was a one of two hotels um, that used to serve the city population when they were coming up for their, you know, north um, run into what was considered a resort area. It's one of the reasons why the, the lakefront doesn't continue through Rogers Park. It was a separate entity. But at some point that gets overrun and you know you start getting people who are moving here. There's a really interesting marketing campaign that starts in the early 1900s where they start marketing some of those old resorts that are in um, Rogers Park to Lake Foresters saying, you know, get your pied a terre so that when you want to come down to the city, you've got a place to stay. 
Well, and that was, that was related to one big problem that, that increasingly happened, the stockyards. The stockyards was scrubbed clean every Sunday. Monday, it smelled pretty good. Tuesday, it smelled pretty good. By Thursday and Friday toward the weekend, it was not good. And the, depending on the wind blow, it could go clear up the shore, at least to Fullerton, uh, the smell. And it could go down as far as 73rd Street on the south side um, if the winds were that way. Well, and the also only, the river didn't smell great. <laughs> nothing. Great. So the only, the reason people clustered along the water was that the offshore breezes at Lakeshore Drive, um, uh, down in, in uh, Kennel and Kenwood and Hyde Park, the reason they had those places was because those offshore breezes would actually hold off the smell from the stockyards. And I'm old enough that I can actually remember the, what that smelled like in 1965. It was amazing. And I was uh, staying at 49th Street in Ellis, north of the University of Chicago in Kenwood. And it was almost indescribable. Um, having grown up in Western Michigan where there were a lot of farms and stuff, I thought I knew, you know, barnyard. Je ne sais pas. This was on a level that you couldn't imagine. And so um, the people who could didn't live near that, or they lived along the lakefront, not because of the pretty lake, but because of the fresh air. And they came out on the weekends, starting probably in the 1880s and 90s, they started coming out to Lake Forest but other suburban places too. Elmhurst was big. Um, and it was the, again, there were waves of a couple different influences. One was um, labor unrest. So, and, and, and not just, well, not labor, but just generally lawlessness or loss of control. Started after, after the Chicago fire, the breakdown of, of law and order, a um, lot of looting, uh, they brought in Sheridan, uh, Philip Sheridan and the troops. Um, 1877, the railroad strike brought in a lot of looting. Sheridan came back. 1886, well, th through all through the 1880s, there was a lot of labor disruption. And um, by 1886, they had the Haymarket Fair, which was a clash between those units and between the two sides. And Sheridan said, look, you know, I'm not keeping coming back here. I'm working on uh, the Apaches and stuff like that. I don't have time for you. So you guys have to build a fort. So that's when Fort Sheridan came along. And by surprise and coincidence, Lake Forest Country Club, um, after the 1894 Pullman strike, took root. The year afterwards, it took root. Um, the biggest of the, of the um, armor estates came in 1904 started the land start being purchased in the fall of 1904, just following the solution to the big Packer strike of 1904. So labor, lawlessness, stuff like that. So these rich people came. But then as you're finding out, as these that really started a second wave that with that um, 1890s stuff, the golf and everything. And that brought in a whole bunch of more kinds of, of um, new immigrants to support all these rich estates. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that we realize is that a large part of the population was actually working class, you know, yeah. for every almost, household, almost everybody hired a staff of 20 to 40 people for a family of maybe 10. And so the magnitude within Lake Forest was that, in fact, most of the people were working class who lived here managing the, um, again, the golf courses, some of the properties, uh, they were landscapers, they ran the household, they were the cooks. Um, they were a, a big part of our population and they were through the entire era of those grand estates. The main part of the population, the main part, yeah. And it was the realization, so Eugene Debs began running for president in 1900 and he ran for president every year until 1920. Um, and I don't have the facts on this, but it's a coincidence that by 1905, the Young Men's Club is organized 
of the, the small business people in, in downtown Lake Forest. And in 1906, a group of estate owners get together to set up a uh, near the North shoreline to set up a neighborhood for them, the West Park neighborhood now it's called, uh, between Green Bay Road and, um, and the, the train line uh, to have middle-class housing. Now, middle-class housing is another way to say that several of the people that were in there were Republican Party officials um, that lived there. Uh, and those houses were built with, uh, first, this, the lots were sold 1906 um, with basically no interest for five years. Oh, 1907, for no interest for five years. It came due in mid-1912. In mid in mid so um, they got the lots pretty much uh, that way. Then they built their houses, started building their houses. And you began to have a, a small business, middle-class planned community there at, around West Park. The idea spread in the next decade to uh, the other side of the tracks, east, um, straight there, but also then south at um, um, around Lake, south of Lake Forest College, south west of Lake Forest College, those neighborhoods. So you began to have these middle class neighborhoods um, to counteract the sort of um, pro labor appeal of Eugene Debs and things like that. They didn't want to have a labor mayor, I guess you'd say. Um, and you had all kinds of different ethnic groups coming in. The neighborhood that I used to live in, which was around that Ryan Place railroad stop on the North Shoreline, there was a German grocery store. Um, there was a Scandinavian grocery store, Swedish grocery store. There was an African-American grocery store. And there were two speakeasies that I know about. One was African-American and one was Scottish. It was in the basement of the house I lived in. It was a Scottish speakeasy. So all these different ethnic groups kind of lived in little clusters by themselves. Um, the gardener- right They were part of households. Like I, we, we oh, yeah. uncovered when we were doing one of the research on one of the stories that's on the digital board, one of the men who lived here at the turn of the century when his wife passed, he married one of his servant girls who had come from Sweden. And what was interesting was in the information, it said she'd come over in a group of 200 Swedish girls who'd come to work in the households um, in Lake Forest. Like it was this mass collective that they brought in to help with the staffing. Yeah. Yeah. And part of that was driven by the fact that they didn't want people of color um, in close proximity with their families in terms of, you know, being the dressers or the kids um, uh, uh, wards, any of those things. And so they brought these young girls in. They were, you know, anywhere between like 15 and I think 21 um, with the idea that they would live in the houses. That was about, that's kind of at about the same time as the uh, Plessy versus Ferguson decision about separate but equal, mm -hmm. which really led to segregation up here too started seeing covenants in rental agreements and things like that, that no African-American or no colored people would be there. Um, so yeah, up until then, there'd been a very close relationship, not an equal relationship, but close relationship with the African-Americans and support for them. Um, that their, their, their businesses and everything started to crumble by 1900 and they only wanted white servants um, that was a big change, big change at that. Right. Well, and some of that was Jim Crow pushing north as well. But, you know, it's interesting. The earliest pictures of the school system, um, the classes are integrated. They're integrated from yeah. the first year. You know, but when you those look at the, were the public schools. The public schools, yes. Well, and it was interesting, too, because a lot of the schools that started, part of the reason was because these parents didn't want their kids to go to boarding school. They wanted them close at home. And so they wanted to support a really strong school system within the area that they could tap into. And so, you know, the wealthiest families used the private schools, but a lot of the families didn't. They wanted the public schools to be strong. That sort of came more later, I think. Um, I think they were very heavily... Um, the support community through the first half of the century. Anyway. Um, they, 
uh, and they, they were they were excellent. And some of the art training and cultural background training that Shirley Paddock uh, has told me about that went on at Gorton School, which was kind of the junior high, I think, that that was excellent. Probably even better than they got in the private schools. Mm -hmm. uh, they learned a lot about art history, learned about architecture, things like that. So um, it, I think you're right, but I think that there was an upward mobility thing about that. If you worked for Cyrus McCormick, um, if, as your kid, as your sons got older, they got offered jobs at the, at the, at the International Harvester. They would get sent to college and then they would go to International Harvester. And I met some of those when they were retired. Was that, was McCormick the one who also built houses that if you worked for him until yes. you retired, you were given your house? Yes. Those were in my neighborhood, which was um, Illinois Road and oh, Washington Circle, uh, Ryan Place. There were, there were houses built for McCormick staff. They got them when they retired, but until then they lived over there. They had lived on their, on their state, but the kids, the high school kids wanted to be close to the um, inner urban tracks to get down to Deerfield Shields High School um, after about 1901. So by, there was pressure by the teens to have spaces for them. Mm -hmm. So that he was building houses in the, in the, um, in the late teens for his staff. And other people too were also, his is better documented, but the, the other families that had big staffs were doing similar kinds of things. Yep. Yeah, and part of why we're so interested in this at the History Center is we've we created this um, sort of initiative that will run across um, nine institutions and five villages on the North Shore that really focuses on what are undertold stories about the working class from Evanston all the way up to Waukegan because they were a huge presence. And we all talk about the Grand Estates and we talk about the Armors, we talk about the McCormicks, but we really haven't focused a lot of our narrative energy on the fact that this was a big part of the population. They ran the shops. And it's an interesting sort of conundrum today that one of the things that you run into with a heavily upper middle class community is it's hard to get staff. It's hard to get wait staff. It's hard to get people who work. Any kind of staff, right? Because they have to commute in for these jobs. And if they're going to do that, they're more likely to go into the city than they are to come north. And so, you know, there is a balancing act of how much you need of sort of every possible socioeconomic strata um, within a community to keep it healthy and vibrant. No, that's true. And that problem, it started, uh, I think in the 70s and all, and, and it is exacerbated as time has gone by. People have moved out. Um, African-Americans could sell their properties and make, because they were, the land was more valuable and could buy a house in another community and pay off, you know, the right. nicer, nicer house uh, so that they left the community. So the, the, that, that group of people um, slowly died off. Um, there were, they were still around through the end of the century as retired people and all. Mm -hmm. um, but you see very few of them. If you go to the senior center, you'll, you'll see some of them. But some of the old families are still represented. The Preservation Foundation's um, secretary is John Julian. And he's descended from um, the Julian family that one of them was killed in World War I, was a chauffeur. Um, they were a whole, part of a large... Cornish community that was in town that um, they played cricket. They, they did everything, uh, you know, the first generation or so and had big, there was a big group of just like the Swedish came in in, in mass, these Cornish people came in mass um, and they were supporting um, in lots of ways, the, the estate owners, the estate owners did not until after world war one, I, I would say, didn't consider Lake Forest their home. They weren't staying overnight, you know. I mean, they would stay overnight, but they wouldn't stay all week through. They would they would be seasonal. Uh, they they were increasingly had apartments on uh, East and North Lakeshore Drive, the Gold Coast. Um, that was basically um, the city homes of uh, Lake Foresters and a few other North Shore people, but the. Uh, 
one of the buildings there is built by Howard Van Doren Shaw in 1910, you know, right the year after they approved the Michigan Avenue Bridge. He's already building a, con, a, a not a condo, but a, a cooperative apartment building. And it's like nine stories and each floor is an apartment for one of his clients. Um, the only exception that I know of is Clyde Carr, who wasn't a client. Clyde Carr had been on the committee for the plan of Chicago. It was his job to convince um, the people who lived on Pine Street to let them have Michigan Avenue there. And so he, he built an apartment there to show that this was gonna be good for the area. But otherwise they were people that had Shaw Estates. And all those people, the armors all had David Adler apartments along there. Um, and then, so they would be there for sure um, from mid-November to mid-April. And then they would come back out and their staffs would have been there. The place would be already for them. And uh, because they did, they, mostly the windows were down from mid-November till mid-April. You didn't have your windows open a lot. And this, the lake breezes would cut off that stench. Um, did you, did you ever experience that stench? Did you ever smell the stockyards? No, I mean, Bubbly Creek, which is still bubbly. Okay. Okay, <laughs> good. Is, All right. It's, it, there, it's a, um, it's just the smell of rot, right? It's the smell of rotting flesh and that's, it's appalling. And the, in the heat of August, okay. it is it's suffocating. Overwhelming for the city of Chicago. And that's why the South Shore's Black Belt became such a big deal. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, then all the architecture there got, when they finally broke that up and did urban renewal, they didn't fix the places up. They just demoed them, you know. So that was a big loss. But so these different waves of people came out here to escape illnesses in the city, looting, um, which we experienced in, in 2000. I mean, mm -hmm. the people breaking into... Um, uh, the the Walmart, not the Walmart, the Walgreens and things up in um, on North Avenue and getting up into that area. That was very traumatic and people didn't feel safe and they just were gone. They were out here. Uh, they, it's interesting too though because that you know eventually crime follows them up here. I mean there's some really interesting crimes of people basically you know, tagging and waylaying vehicles um, going into Lake Forest because the expectation was they were carrying booze and frequently they were, and they were getting robbed for their illegal stash of alcohol that was going into their basement um, uh, storage. But the other thing that was happening is, you know, in the early 1900s, the back of the newspaper, the Lake Forester had um, sort of who was going where. You know, the Smiths were leaving for Europe in November 1st, and they'll be back in March. And they sure. started to realize by publishing when people were going to be out of their house, yeah, they're getting broken into. And they had to stop that and not report until people were back where they had been. <laughs> yeah, because they just they didn't anticipate that people would be reading this and going, oh, I'll be checking out their house while they're gone. <laughs> right. Sure. Uh, yeah. Can the new guy hand up in the back of the class? <laughs> All right. Oops, and you, there he goes. Uh, question. Uh, the, the railroad played a role, obviously. Lake Forest, I don't see too many cities that have, or two suburban cities that have two train stations. How did that happen? When did that happen? So you had the Union Station, you had Ogilvy. Uh, I would imagine Union Station was first. When did the Ogilvy Station come in here? Well, first off, Lake Forest, you know, is a lakefront suburb. As you go west, south of here, all the towns have just the lakefront area and one train station. And then if you go west, you run into Glenview, Deerfield, Niles, um, Skokie. The trains are going through that community. Lake Forest, um, because of that um, 1890s group that came, they played uh, polo, but they mostly, they also did fox hunting. They went west uh, fox hunting um, clear to the Des Plaines. And um, so the Lake Foresters bought up the farmer's property and built estates. 
And so then they, they gradually, just by 1925, they, they annexed a whole bunch of that territory to control development. So Lake Forest has been planned from the start, the original 1857 plan. Um, they've always planned. And um, they added uh, also the up north clear to the Knollwood Club on um, 176. So they took over that western part. The middle part where Lake Forest Academy is didn't get annexed until the 1980s. But basically the idea was that that Western train, which was the Chicago and uh, Milwaukee train track, um, that goes through Deerfield, Glenview, all these other places. So Glenview has an Amtrak station um, on the train that goes up to Milwaukee. We're trying to get one in Lake County um, Lake County has as much population, more than Wyoming or South Dakota, but we can't get an Amtrak station. And um, that's why we have two tracks. It's because Lake Forest annexed all that territory, whereas further south, the, lake, the, the people on the lakefront, and it's true in Lake Bluff too, the people on the lakefront didn't want to have those other areas part of their community. Well, but we did have, we actually used to have more stations and we used to have an east-west track. And then we had, what was it, the Armor of State that it, he actually built his own train tracks from? Well, he had an ownership stake in the railroad. His dad had helped build it. So, um, yeah, he could, if he wanted a station, he could have one. But he also built it into his estate. That yeah, he right. didn't want cars going into his estate. And his estate was so large that he actually ran a small train from the station into um, it, but we had an, an east um, run that was actually further east than the current station for a little bit as well, as my understanding, is that there were- Between the North, the North Shore Line. Yeah. The North Shore Line was that inner urban I mentioned earlier, and it ran uh, from August of 1899 until 1955. And there was another track of that same inner urban that ran along where 41 is, mm -hmm. and then ran until 19, from the 20s, until 1963. Yep. Uh, cars kind of put them out of business. So did mismanagement put them out of business. Well, uh, you know, one of the interesting things about train history, and I am speaking so outside of, you know, what is my core knowledge, but this is my understanding. You're in the right spot. Right, my work with the Encyclopedia of Chicago was that one of the biggest things that we ran into is that unlike in Europe, when they built their trains, they standardized the gauge or the tracks. Yeah. And in America, they're like, nah, do whatever you want. And so everybody who put down track made them different sizes. So when Amtrak was first running between Chicago and Detroit, there was a stretch of 70 miles in Indiana, which had to go no more than 15 miles an hour because the gauge was slightly narrower than the wheels were. And if they went at any speed, it would derail. Ooh. Yep. And yep. so you know, one of the things that we struggled with to create sort of this connectedness across all of these areas was there were only certain tracks that you could use if you weren't going to completely relay the line because they weren't the right width. Right. Yep. Um, so the, a, the, there was competition between the Northwestern and the um, North Shoreline, but they, they cooperated. So the Lake Bluff train station was built because it was an interchange between the line going straight west out to Mundelein and the uh, CNNW line. The CNNW built that with the idea that it was gonna be a, an interchange between the two. Otherwise, Lake Bluff, you know, it had a small population, but it wasn't, a big brick station wasn't in the cards for them otherwise, but as an interchange station, it made sense. Yeah, and so back, back to your question, Pete. Um, yeah. So Ogilvy goes in 1911. It's a Chicago and Northwestern station. Yeah. yeah. And that was, that, was a, that was just for the one company. Um, and that's what this North Line is, is part of that one company. It was originally the Chicago and Northwestern, became the Union Pacific in the 90s or 80s, something in there. Um, and the other one, the Union Station is an older station. Um, but the, the older line is the CNNW line. It was the 1870s, 20 years later, that the, the Western line went through. Um, and this, they were just competing railroads. Mm -hmm. Made yeah. good sense. And they served slightly different communities. Everett was out West. 
Lake Forest was on the east side. So they they both had purpose. Now, Armour wanted his house west of all five or four of these tracks. He didn't want to have any um, racket going by his house. And that's why I built the great big stone. There's a brick wall. If you go out there, you see the enormous brick wall that he built. And it's still there, yeah. built really well, to try and cut the sound down. Huh. Well, holy cow, guys. <laughs> well, wow. <laughs> the new guy's learning a lot. I'm learning more than uh, so, some people have been in Lake Forest all their lives. This is fantastic. This is, a, this is, this is worth the tuition, I'm telling you. <laughs> um, so, Ca Carol, thank you so much for joining us today. What a great show. Carol Summerfield from the Lake Forest Lake Bluff History Center. Is that right? Did I get it? Yeah. History Center comes first. It's the History Center of Lake History Forest Center. and Lake Bluff. Lake Bluff. We just call God. it the History Center. Yeah. The History Center. Okay. Yeah. And then well, you got. Is there a... me. again? Wow. We're excited about this project. If you have, if the listeners have stories, if they've got materials to share, we're collecting. Good. And oh, so, yeah. um, and you know, at one point we'll do another show that that Art is also working with me on about um, how travel changes the way people see being American. And that's a new initiative that we're also collecting stories on, which is travels from Lake Forest to other places and how it changes you, how it changes the way you see Lake Forest, the community, being American and the world. Oh, wow. Well, Carol, special guest, you be a co-host anytime, you know. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get you back. It, it, it interrupts with my grant writing needs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, this is great. I, any any time. I mean, heck, this show is evolving all the time. Uh, our our class. Uh, you know, we're going to have different uh, classrooms in here. It's going to it's going to be fantastic. Art, you got anything else? No, that I mean, I think that uh, to, just to sum up, that Lake Forest is an unusual community. It's kind of unique. Uh, there really wasn't anything else in the Chicago suburbs like it. It was a millionaire's town from day one. And um, they were new millionaires. So often the waves of people coming from Sweden, Cornwall, um, the American South, um, they knew better how to, what wealthy people were supposed to live like than the people that had the money themselves. And it's a recurring American story of mm -hmm. people being uh, accum accommodated into, that's not the right word, assimilated into the upper class um, and their servants played a big role in that. They also developed their own community, their own lodges. Um, and so we, we have a very rich community and you mentioned that you have the little 2000 Lake Forest Estates People and Culture book, uh, Pete. Really? There's yep. a chapter in there about the town, the townspeople. And this dual story um, is, is, part, is, is covered in kind of executive summary in there. But um, it was Shirley Paddock who was my co-author on that. And she was um, groundbreaking and opening up some of our eyes about all the richness of this community. No, it's my eyes are like this. Art, thanks for making me smarter on Lake Forest history. Carol, <laughs> thank you as well. Most welcome. It was a pleasure. It was indeed. Oh. Well, thank you for listening to the Lake Forest podcast, the art class edition with special guest Carol Summerfield. Please give us five stars on Apple Pop Podcasts and smash that like button on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Let us know what you'd like to hear about in the upcoming shows. Again, I'm Pete, and I can be reached at Pete at LakeForestPodcast.com. The link will be in the podcast notes below. On behalf of my co hosts, Arthur Miller and special guest slash co-host Carol Summerfield. We thank you for listening. Our class is now over. Cue the band. Awesome show, guys. Thank you, Carol. And thank you both for working around my... Oh, no, we're fixing.